You are listening to Killer, and this is case number 10, Pork Chop Rob. Lock your doors, bolt your windows, and turn off the lights. We're about to begin. Now, the Robert Picton tapes. The serial killer comes close to admitting multiple murders in a newly released video of a police interrogation, but Picton stops short of a complete confession. The 11-hour interview shows Picton saying that he had one more apparent killing in mind, but it didn't happen because he says he got sloppy. A news reporter Eric Thompson has the latest. What else did you do? Rob is Robert Willie Picton, slumped in his chair, looking bored with the proceedings as the police officer tried to get him to talk hours after he was arrested. Okay, what girls that you remember have ever been out to your place? His place was a pig farm in Port Coquitlam, where police had found the remains of some of Vancouver's missing women. In the early hours, as Picton is shown photos of the women, he insists he knows nothing. With each picture, there's nary a glimmer of recognition. That would have been Mona Wilson, one of the six women Picton was convicted of killing, six counts of murder in the second degree. Because the Supreme Court of Canada recently quashed Picton's bid for a new trial, the Crown stayed the other 20 murder charges. This criminologist says the tape is chilling, but nothing about it is surprising. He just looked upon this as a number. So totally depersonalized, so totally detached, so totally insensitive, so totally unempathetic, classic psychopathic personality. Picton has never been out of jail since those police interviews of eight years ago. He is now 60 years old and is serving a life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years, meaning he will likely die behind bars. Eric Thompson, A News. Speaking in Vancouver today, Prime Minister Stephen Harper says he does not uh, seem eager for a public inquiry into the disappearance of women from the downtown east side, some of whom fell victim to Robert Picton. The Prime Minister says until now his government has been waiting for the completion of the judicial process, and so far the idea of an inquiry has not been under consideration. We all know these are horrific uh, crimes, and uh, we're obviously glad there's been uh, conviction in some cases. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll want to look at what we need to do to prevent uh, this kind of thing or detect it much earlier in the future because uh, we obviously don't want to see a repetition of any of these horrific events. Premier Gordon Campbell says his government's going to do everything it can to ensure these kinds of crimes don't happen again. The Premier says both RCMP and Vancouver Police are in the midst of their own reviews of the matter. The Premier says his cabinet will consider those findings before deciding whether a public inquiry is necessary. He expects a decision on that within a matter of weeks. There are more questions tonight about how police in British Columbia handled the Robert Picton investigation, this time prompted by the release of video at the missing women's inquiry. It's from January of 2000, two years before the pig farmer would be charged with murder. Ian Hanamansing is on the story for us tonight. Ian. Peter, it's disturbing enough to see Robert William Picton questioned by police 12 years ago. Even more chilling to know afterwards, he just walked away. Already the leading suspect in the case of Vancouver's missing women, it was a relaxed Robert William Picton who sat down with police. Do you drink? Oh, no, no, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't use drugs, and then everybody says, how can you guys so room bloodshot? I says. This tape is now public because it's evidence at this judicial inquiry, trying to find out whether police should have arrested Picton earlier. During the interrogation, investigators asked him about a vicious knife fight with a woman at his farm. I turned around. I didn't take the knife away from her. I did not take the knife away from her. I aimed it to her and I knifed her twice. I did do that. I admit I did that. That's one thing I didn't, shouldn't have done. Two hours of questions, no incriminating answers. So you've never taken any of the prostitutes back to your trailer? 
Not since this incident, no. Hey. But before that incident? No, 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 no. This now retired RCMP officer was watching the questioning as it took place back in 2000 and today said it was frustrating. It certainly wasn't a textbook case on how to do an interview. Lawyer Cameron Ward says the tape is in sharp contrast to another far more successful interrogation of a serial killer, Russell Williams. Uh, well, that was a textbook example of how to interrogate a, po a possible suspect. In Picton's case, it would be two more years before he was arrested. Had the interview been better handled, the result may well have been differently, and Mr. Picton may well have been prevented from murdering a number of women who died after that date. In hindsight, of course, these missed opportunities seem clear. Now the inquiry will have to determine whether they should have been obvious to police and prosecutors at the time. Peter? All right, Ian, thanks very much. Ian's in Vancouver tonight. Good evening. There are growing calls tonight for a public inquiry into the Robert Picton case as more details emerge now that the remaining 20 murder charges against him have been set aside. Most of the publication bans in the Picton case have been lifted, and we are now hearing evidence that the jury at his murder trial did not. The release of these new and shocking details is prompting some strong reactions from the families of the women that Picton murdered, including here on Vancouver Island, and more calls for an inquiry. Shachi Curl has our top story and the graphic details. These are among the thousands of documents collected during the course of the Robert Picton trial. They contain information that until now could not be reported. Picton was charged and convicted of killing six women, sex trade workers connected to Vancouver's downtown east side. Yesterday, charges against Picton related to the murders of 20 other women were stayed. And as a result, the publication ban is now lifted. Information about the crimes and the police investigation are coming to light, information that was kept from the jury. The public has to have access to as much of the information as is necessary for it to be able to scrutinize and debate uh, what happened and whether uh, people did a good job. The new details include the story of a bloody knife fight between Picton and an alleged would-be victim on his farm. The struggle sent both Picton and a prostitute to the same hospital back in 1997. Doctors removed a handcuff on the prostitute's wrist using a key found in Picton's pocket. At the time, charges against him were dropped. Other gruesome details revealed DNA of the murdered women found in processed meat on his farm. Marnie Robert Frey was, was murdered by Robert Picton. In Port Hardy today, her parents and daughters say they are happy the public is finally hearing these details. It's about time. I think the public needs to know exactly what happened and what we've gone through. They're still calling for a public inquiry into how police, who were aware of Picton as far back as the mid-90s, couldn't arrest him until 2002. But damn it, you know, they knew about this clown in 1998, and so did some of their, their other people. Like Kim Rospo knew about it. And what did they do with him? They gave him the golden handshake and said goodbye. I mean, what a, this is a crock. Attorney General Mike DeYoung could decide on an inquiry as soon as next month. Meantime, the phrase say these details are only the beginning of what the public will learn. Well, I, th I think they are going to be horrified, and that's why I, I, uh, I didn't like the media ban to start with. I, I think if the, uh, the public should know what's going on. More information will include Picton's jailhouse confession. But to the relief of the phrase and 25 other families, a ban will remain on access to photos and of body parts found on the farm. In Victoria, Shachi Curl, A News. Robert Willie Picton was born October 24, 1949 in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, Canada. Picton was known to be quiet and socially awkward. He grew up on a farm with his mother Louise, his father Leonard, his sister Linda, and his brother David. At the age of 12, he saved enough money to buy his own calf, which he treated as a pet. Upon returning home from school and two weeks after purchasing the calf, he couldn't find it anywhere. He continued the search looking all around their property until he finally entered the butchering area of the barn where he found his calf hanging upside down, butchered. Willie was distraught that his calf had been butchered, and he didn't speak to his family for days. In that moment, he recounts, I finally realized we're not here forever. We're here for the time we're here for. Picton's relationship with his parents was interesting. He wasn't very close to his father. He described him as on the go and always working on the farm. Picton mentions that the pair fought on occasion, and he wouldn't share much about his personal life. Willie was much closer with his mother. 
He says they were like two peas in a pod. His mother died while Picton was in his late 20s, about two years after his father passed away. She never met his only girlfriend. An interesting story involving his younger brother, Dave, and his mother would help to paint a picture of what kind of upbringing Willie would have. Willie's younger brother, Dave, after getting his driver's license, took his father's truck out for a spin on the evening of October 16, 1967. As Dave was driving down the road, he encountered a 14-year-old boy named Tim Barrett. Tim was walking down the road, road only to be suddenly smashed by Dave's truck. Dave immediately raced home to alert his mother that he had hit Tim. After Louise inspected Tim, she pushed him into the side of the road, and then she pushed him into a slough that ran off the road. And just for your information, a slough is basically just a ditch full of water. Louise instructed Dave to take their car to their mechanic immediately and get it repaired. The next morning, Tim's family and neighbors went searching for him. They came across his shoes on the side of the road. One of Tim's neighbors spotted Tim in the slough. The police arrived and pulled Tim's lifeless body from the water. The autopsy revealed his cause of death was drowning, not the fractured skull, dislocated pelvis, or the cranial hemorrhage caused by the truck striking him. Dave didn't get away without some issue. He did go to juvenile court, but the details are sealed and not much is known. As for Louise, she was not charged, but the neighbors and locals quickly learned the truth of what happened that night. Dude. Can you imagine your mom going out and just, like, rolling some boy who'd been smashed by a truck into a body of water and leaving him to die? Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe this when I was reading this story. This is almost worse than what you have read later on in the story. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, just, oh, well, shove him in the water, get the truck to the shop, get it fixed, no big deal. Don't worry about it, son. It, it, she treated him like roadkill. I mean, literally, like, if, you, if you'd if struck, like, a deer, you'd just, like, try and push it off to the side of the road if you can and then go around it and continue on your way. I I couldn't believe this. This was absolutely insane. Well, the absurd, the absurd part is if they, they, the autopsy revealed that he drowned, okay, but how thorough was the autopsy? I mean, obviously, they knew about these other injuries. The kid just doesn't fall into a body of water along the side of the road and drown and have all this other stuff wrong with him. Yeah, and it's just like he had he had a fractured skull, a dislocated pelvis, and a cranial hemorrhage and and out of all of that, he died from being drowned <laughs> because he was laying in this he got pushed into this water. I mean, clearly he obviously was like completely incapacitated when she pushed him over the, you know, into the ditch because I mean, I can't imagine there's a ton of water in this thing, but I mean, you can drown in two inches of water. It's not, you know, it doesn't take much, especially if you can't move. So I don't know if he was like knocked out and she just rolled him over. I was like, F this. Yeah. And the only thing that I can, you know, gather from that, that they said that he drowned was he, he could have been unconscious, but still slightly breathing and then aspirated the water. And that's what finally killed him. But what led to that state? And with no further investigation, I mean, he went to juvenile court and it's sealed, which right, is crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and later on in the story, Dave's a little bit of part of the story here. Like, you know, clearly not too much happened to him cause he's around later on, you know? And so, uh, it's just weird. Like, and, and Louise is the one who pushed him into the ditch. Like she's the one who really, I mean, ultimately kills the kid. If he didn't die from the, the damage from the truck, you know, then, then Dave didn't kill him. And she did because he died from drowning. Now, maybe he would have died from his injuries. I believe they said he wouldn't. Like, they thought that he would have survived those injuries from the autopsy. It's basically saying that Louise killed him in so many words. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. That, that's nuts. Like, I mean, you have kids. And it's not like that kid did something to your kid. Like, your kid did something to that kid. And so how are you able to justify Like, you've got to be a little bit messed up in the mind to do that. Yeah, I'm not sure what I write in that lady's Mother's Day card the following year after something like that, <laughs> to be completely honest. <laughs> well, if it was your mom, you'd probably write her the best Mother's Day card of all time because you didn't go to jail. Oh, my God. Insane lead into this story for sure. Yeah, so so that just kind of gives you some context to, you know, <laughs> what these kids are growing up with. And, uh, and, and you know, Willie and his dad didn't really... It doesn't sound like they got along very well. Not a lot is known about their relationship, but it sounds more or less like um, he was a mama's boy and, 
you know, if your mom, if your mom's doing that kind of shit, I don't know that that's a good thing. Yeah. Not a very good um, upbringing, to say the least. No, not at all. Willie dropped out of school at the age of 14 in 1963. He took a job as a butcher's apprentice and was very good at it. Over the next four years, he kept up on his mandatory chores on the farm and his apprenticeship. In 1970, after he turned 21, Willie quit his apprenticeship suddenly and began working full-time for the farm. He continued to care for the pigs, but then began buying new pigs and butchering them. At this time, Willie also began frequenting West Coast Reduction, an animal waste disposal company near downtown Vancouver. This plant would take animal byproduct and turn it into other things. He began frequenting a seedy area known as Low Track in the east side of Vancouver. It is said that this is one of the most concentrated areas of drug users, pimps, and prostitutes, and just people that are most likely lost to the world. Willie began to pay for prostitutes. He would treat them really well, buying them whatever they wanted. He started frequenting the Astoria Hotel. There, he was met with people who treated him well and as an equal, and women were willing to do sexual favors for him. For the first time in his life, Willie began to feel powerful. Willie began frequenting prostitutes more and more. Eventually, he started becoming violent with the girls he was picking up. He became a regular in the low-track community and would work all day and frequent prostitutes at night. In 1978, his parents' health had failed. In January, his father died and his mother became ill with cancer. His mother, the woman who had so much power and control over him as a child, became sick and fragile. Willie took care of her, changing her diapers and taking just general care of her up until her death in April. It was a bit of a shock to Willie. The experience of nurturing and caring for his mother warped him. The three siblings split the inheritance, which was modest, and Willie took over operations of the farm. Willie's brother Dave took over the main house. Willie lived in a trailer in an isolated section of the property. For the first time in his life, he was free. Willie was a pretty disgusting person. People often had to tell him to take a bath. So the friends he would keep were also fairly disgusting as well. Most of his friends or associates were women he paid for drugs. He'd have them to do chores around the farm, but they wouldn't have sex with him. In 1980, Willie was cruising through Vancouver when he came across a 14-year-old. He picked up the 14-year-old girl in his truck and held her at knife point and raped her. And then he threw her out of his truck and moved on. He continued a cycle of working on the farm during the day and frequenting the prostitutes at night. In 1994, his siblings decided to sell the north end of their farm, and they made almost $2 million and split it between the three of them. In 1996, Dave and Willie formed a social events business named Piggy's Palace Good Time Society. It was really just a giant excuse to have huge parties at the remaining farm space. And just to note there, people who would frequent the farm tended to be like hell's angels and like just crazy disorderly people. Many of the parties involved Willie bringing a prostitute to the party. He would party with them all night and take them back to his trailer. He would force them to have sex, and it would usually be violent in nature, oftentimes involving bondage. Soon, his penchant for rough sex would turn violent. In March 1997, a prostitute named Wendy Ice Daughter went home with Willie. He tried to handcuff her, but she broke free and Willie grew enraged. He came after her with a knife, but she was able to grab a knife and fight back. Wendy managed to escape and fled the farm half-closed. An elderly couple encountered her and picked her up and drove her to the hospital. Police charged Picton with assault, but it was later dismissed when Wendy was too afraid to come to face him in trial. In August 1997, Willie returned to Low Track. He approached Marnie Frey, offered to buy her drugs in exchange for sex. He took her back to his trailer and they had sex. Afterwards, he turned violent and murdered Marnie. It's not known what happened to her body, but some believe she may have been dismembered and sent to the West Coast Reduction Plant. Between 1995 and 1997, 21 prostitutes had gone missing from Low Track. In 1998, nine more women vanished, and police did not investigate. They wrote it off as women just disappearing, taking a greyhound to visit family, or something of that sort. So interestingly here, you know, um, which seems to be sort of a common thing, it sounds like whenever uh, people are going after and murdering prostitutes, it sounds like the police are very quick to just kind of say, eh, eh, no big deal these people are travelers <laughs> and then you come to find out later it's like a uh, hundred body count later <laughs> oh wait someone was over here just picking them off <laughs> yeah no kidding the the interesting part of this was what we heard in the trailer was actually that that third piece of the trailer um the parents were marnie Frey that were talking to the media at the end there and her dad said this is you know complete and total bs you know why are they sealing the records why are they you know putting a media ban in place we want everybody to know how horrific these crimes are and what we're exactly dealing with 
I think it goes back to that culture of Canadians being super nice. Everyone always says like, there's no mean Canadian people <laughs> and, and they're just like, they don't want this crap out there. You know, maybe that's why our country is so messed up. We put this crap out there for people to consume. I don't know. Anyway, um, go ahead. I was going to say it kind of worked against him in this case, though, because they had the opportunity to arrest this guy years ago, and he was free to kill for, you know, this happened in 97 when he had this incident with the knife and this Marnie Frey. And, you know, another five years go by until they actually arrest this guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and again, it goes back to that whole, like, prostitutes aren't people kind of thing and they just kind of act like it just doesn't matter while yes they may be the low of the low in society they are still human beings we should still try to take care of them if we can you know some of them do clean their act up and i think it's worth it just for that but yeah this is it's interesting and um you know the one thing i always find kind of funny here is how they uh, sell that farm and then they created a social events business called piggy's palace good time society <laughs> and then knowing that this dude is like one of the most disgusting humans on earth just in general like he's just not clean like he's just super gross i just couldn't imagine people coming over to his house and partying <laughs> like if his body is as disgusting as it is or he's just like covered in dirt all the time and stinks how how do you, how do you get people to come over to your house like his house has to be just as disgusting right yeah well look at some of the, if you look on YouTube and, and grab some of those news clips and actually watch the videos, this place is a complete and total dump. I mean, there's broken down cars everywhere. They show some actual pictures from inside the processing plant. I, for, for one, I can't believe this is a pig farm. And for two, what kind of regulation does Canada have on their meat production? Because if I saw this place after the fact, after I had bought pork products, you know, no matter what it was, holy shit, why would you eat anything that came out of this place? Oh, man, no kidding. And to go back to your point about like it being just a dump and people going there to party, I equate this to New Orleans. New Orleans is like, no offense if you live in New Orleans, but like Bourbon Street area is like a giant shithole. It's disgusting. It stinks. It smells like piss and vinegar. It is so nasty. And there's like my first experience on Bourbon Street, I went there for work and I went with a coworker and we were walking down Bourbon Street the day before we were meeting with our customers. I'm not a big partier and I'm walking down the street. The first thing I encounter five seconds into Bourbon Street is a dude huffing a can of duster, convulsing in an alleyway, laying on his back, just like tweaking out. At that moment, I'm like, okay, why am I here? This is disgusting. Like who comes here? And then you're walking down the street and people are just like having a good old time getting trashed in the street. And I'm like, can't we get trashed in a place that isn't a giant shithole? <laughs> it's, it's so gross. Like if I got drunk, I wouldn't want to be laying on the ground outside. <laughs> like, you know, if I, if I was like totally wasted, I wouldn't want to put my hands on the ground. Uh, I didn't even want my shoes touching the ground in some of these places. It was so gross there. No offense again, if you live there, it's not directed directly at people there but i just don't get it i don't get the allure like some people just rave about going to new orleans and stuff and i guess it's just not my thing i don't know sorry if it is your thing but it's not my thing and we'll agree to disagree i know you've been there a lot what do you think just when you said that bourbon street has a unique smell and as soon as you said that <laughs> i remember that smell and the smell was <laughs> awful I do. There were a couple places in the French Quarter, not necessarily Bourbon Street particularly, that I like that were like, you know, open venues for music, lots of good jazz music and stuff, and good food, of course. But Okay, Cafe du Monde. Right. Yes, that was very good. But Beignets are delicious. That place was sweet. Yeah, but Bourbon Street itself is just god awful. And the hotel that I stayed in, the real eye opener was the next morning. I had to get up early and and be to the the location for work that morning and I, I go out to get my car and I'm looking down at Bourbon Street. I'm only right like a block away from Bourbon Street. I can see the entryway into Bourbon Street from my hotel and there's this giant truck with just this huge boom on the back of it just spraying high pressure water on the street just to wash all the shit down <laughs> in the gutters. <laughs> so right there's where your smell is coming from. All the hor all the horse shit from the carriages, all the vomit from the drunk partiers, you know, whatever else is left in the street, they just wash it down the gutter. Yeah, exactly. Okay, my point exactly. Like thumbs down on Bourbon Street in my opinion. Oh man, that place is so gross. Okay. Sorry. But back to <laughs> Willie's place, it is a disgusting just dump, and I don't know who goes to this place to party. Why 
why they're so desperate to have a good time that they would go to this place in particular if it's just because there's like absolutely no rules anything goes i'd assume that's what it is yeah i don't know um it's pretty nasty there and and that dude is nasty like i said so like how can you <laughs> like i don't know i i couldn't do it i i if i saw that dude and he invited me to his house i'd be like uh thanks but no thanks and not shake his hand <laughs> you know what i'm saying i'd be out of there and back to the not to knock anybody in Canada that might listen to the show. I'm not sure if we do. I mean, we have feedback from some of our international listeners, and we know kind of where they're listening at. From the land down under. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> i got to get that song stuck in your head again. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, what I was going to say is the reduction plant. I grew up on a farm. I know exactly what a reduction plant is. It's, it's basically a place where you take, uh, you know, animal matter or waste or dead animals to, to properly dispose of them. And, you know, what kind of inspection process do they have at this reduction plant? They don't see chopped up body parts from people and the stuff that's being delivered to them because the farm that I grew up on, you know, if you have an animal pass away, you have somebody come and pick it up. It's it's the entire animal. You're not chopping it up into pieces to have it delivered, right? Well, yeah, that's the interesting part of this story is... <laughs> What, what was he sending to the reduction plant? Because I think uh, we'll get down to that here in a few minutes. But yeah, it, uh, it it's definitely suspect. I I don't I don't know how you do that where you you allow people to just come dump stuff at your place. Like, what's the process there? I mean, obviously you probably have to have some sort of credentials as far as like being a farmer and like prove that you're a farmer. You can't just be like random dude off the street who comes and dumps bodies over there. But um, even you know, animals or people. Um, you know, so I can't imagine that, like, he had to have some sort of qualifications to be there, I imagine, I hope. I don't know. Did you? Do you know? Do you know if you had to for your guys' farm? You had to be a licensed producer, you know. I, I grew up on a dairy farm, but, I mean, you still have animals that you have to, you know, do something with when they when they pass away or if they get sick and something happens to them. You have to have somewhere to get rid of them. You just can't go out on your property and dump them, even though I know... You know, in some cases, other people that had similar farms would do that. They would have these huge compost piles and just melt the animals down, essentially, on their farm, which is nasty and gross. But it, the good thing was most of the reduction plants, they're just they're just grinding up all this animal matter for dog food and cat food and stuff like that. So if you ever have a desire to eat dog food, better think again. <laughs> yeah, truth. The police spent... Next to no time investigating the situation, there had been around 30 prostitutes that had gone missing, but the police tended to write them off. The community in the low track area started to become fearful. They did not believe the women were just disappearing on their own accord. Willie was still able to tempt women despite all of this. He was still paying good money to the girls and did have a reputation for being nice. Willie had some friends from the community, one of them being Lynn Ellingson. She lived on the farm for a few months in 1999. After getting high in his trailer one night, she fell asleep. She woke up for some reason, perhaps a lot of noise coming from the outside. She went outside and saw a light coming from the barn. She walked over to the barn and saw the red painted toenails of Georgina Papin hanging. Willie pulled Lennis inside and told her if she was to say anything, she'd be right beside Georgina. She ended up leaving and never saying a word. In 1999, another victim was found in downtown Vancouver, Brenda Wolf. She was a drug addict who came to Willie's pig farm looking for drugs, but she was murdered. He tended to strangle his victims while they were handcuffed or bound, and then he would carry them out to his slaughterhouse and cut them up. Most of his victims were sent to the West Coast Reduction. As the paranoia surrounded the women in downtown Vancouver, he began to have a harder time getting women to come back to his trailer. He had a few female friends that would help him lure victims. He sent his friend Dina Taylor to the women's shelters to go get women to come back to Willie's party. Willie's M.O. would be to bring the women back and then eventually accuse him of stealing from him before becoming increasingly violent and eventually attacking them. By 2001, the amount of missing women had reached 62. The police couldn't ignore the problem anymore, and the Vancouver police, alongside the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, began an investigation into the missing women. Thousands of tips flooded the hotlines. Willie's name began to circulate, but police didn't see enough in his records to really go after him, and he was dismissed. Willie continued killing murdering Andrew Josbury and Serena Abatsway. This time, he didn't immediately dispose of the bodies. He put them in plastic buckets and stored them in a meat freezer. In November 2001, Willie picked up Mona Wilson. Instead of taking her to his trailer, he took her to a camper he had behind his barn. 
After they had sex, he savagely beat her. This time, he used a gun, a twenty-two revolver, to murder his next victim. The trailer was filled with blood. Well, we really haven't covered much about this part, but kind of alluded to it heavily was the women were, it seems like in most cases, a ground up and sent to that reduction plant. But then also it was said that he fed these women to pigs. And so to go back to, I want to say, one of our first episodes, if not the first episode, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we had actually mentioned a hog farm. Oh, no, this was the Molly Tibbetts case. We mentioned the hog farm, and I asked the question, do you think anybody had fed people to pigs because pigs will eat anything to try to hide bodies? And we had an eagle-eyed listener point this case out to us, and so we are doing it for them. And honestly, I actually, after starting to read this, I had heard this case before. I had just kind of forgotten about it. I don't know how. I mean, this is a pretty ridiculous case, but I did forget about it. And so... um, That's kind of what spurred us to do this case this week was that whole statement that I made back in case number two. I just thought it was fascinating that this probably actually does happen (laughs) more frequently than we probably would like to admit. It's probably not common, but, um, you know, I thought that was an interesting thing was it sounds like he would grind up some of these bodies and feed them to his pigs. And then also on top of that, take them and send them to that reduction plant, which then gets dispersed to who knows, you know, people, pets. I don't know. I'm just thinking, can you imagine what what goes through the mind of a guy who can grind up a body and feed it to his pigs just to to get rid of it and feed them? Yeah, and and the other interesting thing is that um, you know, like they, they people say that he is really stupid. Like he has like near no intelligence at all. And, you know, so I don't think he feels anything. And and just remember his mother took a dead boy and or injured boy and pushed him off into the to the watery ditch to drown um i don't think this family has much empathy wow <laughs> yeah i guess not but just it, it's one thing to process animals for food and have a whole a whole process in place for that but then to to be hanging bodies in that same processing plant and doing the same exact thing is just i guess we're normal I guess to us, we can't think about how <laughs> insane that is or just how sickening that is we just can't fathom it yeah, exactly. I mean, I can't fathom what that's like. Like, you know, taking a human body and hanging it on a meat hook next to a pig just seems ridiculous. But <laughs> to them, it was normal. Then again, I've never, I've never slaughtered an animal or shot an animal, so I, I honestly couldn't tell you how I feel about it. I'd probably feel a little sad about it, but I would do it because I like meat. I eat meat, so I don't, I don't believe in like torturing animals or anything like that at all. Um, but you know, if you kill animals in a humane way and then use them for food, I'm totally cool with it. Uh, I'm not cool with like living conditions of animals where they're like stacked on top of each other and they can't live like an animal. They live like just a caged food source. Like, I don't think that's cool, but you know, I'm all for it. Let's do it. Yeah. There's nothing glorious about processing an animal, even if you're doing it the right way for food, but no, not at all. Yeah. Just, uh, I read an article before we move on to the next section here. I read an article where they compared this guy to Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And and they said they said the things that this guy did and what they witnessed and what they found at this guy's, you know, farm. It, it made Leatherface look like Sesame Street. So <laughs> oh, wow. That was a comparison they made for the one little snippet that I read or something along that lines. So Yeah, and you know what's what's interesting is the Canadian police, um, the investigation team, they they kept all this stuff under wraps as much as they could. So I still don't think we know nearly as much as they do you know like i don't even think it's close like it's very scattered the evidence that they they've released and some of the information that people actually have it's not widely spread anywhere um they kept a lot of these records under lock and key i mean dave's dave's juvenile record still hidden from the public so who knows what else from this investigation is still hidden from the public yeah no kidding it's it's crazy to think about by the end of 2001, 64 women had been missing and police were no closer to solving the case. In February 2002, an unexpected lead came to officers. A truck driver who occasionally worked at the farm reported that he had seen illegal weapons on the property. The police were curious to learn more about the potential murder suspect, so they obtained a warrant and headed to the farm. On February 6, 2002, a Canadian police raided the pig farm in search of illegal weapons. Upon investigating, one of the officers spotted an inhaler belonging to Serena Abbotsway, one of the missing women. 
At this point, the team decided to pause the weapons investigation and obtain new search warrants. Investigators began searching the property for signs of the missing women and were quick to uncover a grisly scene. Police found the camper full of the blood of Mona Wilson. It was soaked into the mattress, on the walls, in the kitchen, and eventually they found her bisected head, brain, and other parts floating in a pink soup-like substance floating in a barrel outside of the barn. Willie was detained and taken to the police station for investigation. After 11 hours of questioning, they didn't come away with much. They put an undercover officer in the cell with Willie where he would imply or admit to a lot of different things. He shared with the investigator he was going for an even 5-0, implying he had murdered 49 people. He also shared that he disposed of their bodies at the reduction plant. He admitted that he got sloppy at the end. On February 22nd, Picton was charged with the murders of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. The investigation of the pig farm continued. Investigators created a grid system of the property, and they combed over the property grid by grid. They uncovered two buckets. Each of them contained the head, hands, and feet of Serena Abbotsway and Andrea Jonesbury. Josebury. They took thousands of DNA samples. By April 2002, Picton was charged with five counts of murder. On March 11, 2004, Canadian health official Dr. Perry Kendall gave a statement to the press announcing that human remains have been contaminate, may have contaminated some of the pork products that were produced and consumed by Canadians. The family of Marnie Frey, one of the many victims, claims that they would get meat from that pig farm frequently and became concerned that they may have eaten their loved one. After 22 months, police had enough evidence to charge Picton with 27 murders. That is a lot to take in. <laughs> um... The family of Marnie Frey there that thinks they may have possibly eaten Marnie Frey? Could you imagine? Somebody murdered your loved one, you have no idea where they're at, you continue on with your life, and then you come to find out you may have possibly eaten your loved one? Like, how disgusting is that? Jesus Christ. I... <laughs> that might turn me into a vegan. That that would have turned me into a vegan at that very point in time. <laughs> That is the, probably the most disgusting thing. I hope that's the most disgusting thing that we ever have to describe on a case ever, because that is just heinous. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Oh, I mean, that's so gross. Okay, and so let's talk about, um, so he was in that jail cell with the undercover cop, and he's, it's a, there's a recorded confession tape. It's pretty grainy and hard to hear. Um, but in it, he says he was trying to go for an even 5-0, meaning 50 so he claims he's killed 49 people and uh you know it's a lot a lot of people i mean when you think about when we open the show with all these mass shootings like most of the mass shootings like stop around 20 you know like or less and you know like 10 people is a lot and to say that you've killed almost 50 people as a single person like one by one that is insane like just think about that 50 people I think some of the cases that we've already covered, I don't think we even touched on even close to 50, right? We had we had Dean Coral, the, the candy man. Well, he was in the 30s, right? So Yeah, I think he was 24-ish. 24 to 27. Those two numbers are sticking in my head. Some, somewhere in like the mid to high 20s. It, maybe it was just suspected that it could have been closer to 30 because there were some that they just they just didn't know about or never had evidence to, you know, to bring into that fold. But 50 people is crazy. Oh, yeah. Five people is crazy. But 50 is, like, astronomically insane. Like, if, I mean, that's just ridiculous. But then again, this guy's kind of a moron, and he probably can't count very well. So who knows? Well, he was keeping track, though. I mean, if, if his <laughs> statement was true to that cop, he's like, I know I killed 49. I don't know where he's keeping track or if it's just a count that's running in his head, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. Um, you know, who knows with this guy? He's a complete, obviously, psycho. Uh, but, man, like... And then, you know, they go there on a weapons charge and they find this blood soaked mattress in this trailer there's blood on the walls and they find a bisected head with hands and feet shoved into it like and then like this in this soupy bloody barrel like oh my god do you know how like, i would puke everywhere if i came across that i think i would just blow chunks instantly <laughs> And the more we talked about le leading up to this this point in the story, I started thinking about how these processing plants deliver, you know, stuff, what's left over to these these reduction plants. And I think they do they do use like 
50 gallon plastic drums and just everything that's left over, like from the animal that they process, like the skin, the organs, you know, the bones, everything just gets dumped into these barrels and they seal them up and transport them. So that's probably how he was getting the bodies there. Whatever, whatever means he was using to chop up the animals, he was chopping up the bodies and just mixing them in with the reduction stuff that went in those well, barrels. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly it. Like he was just kind of putting them in with everything else. And it's like, how would you know? And that just makes me feel really gross because I just started eating pork rinds the other day again. <laughs> And I'm just thinking about, like, if you had fried human skin pork rinds, like, oh, it makes me sick to my stomach just thinking about it. Dude, you, dude you're making it really hard to uh, get excited about breakfast here in about an hour <laughs> because I got a pound of bacon upstairs I'm ready to fry up. Well, you better hope it's not your, like, second cousin. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, gross. God. But I, I distinctly remember when I was probably in high school when, when we would send animals to the reduction plant, these were animals that just passed away. So they were, they weren't cut up or nothing. There, there was actually a guy that worked for the reduction plant that would come to the farm and he had this truck that was specifically designed to haul these, you know, perished animals to the reduction plant. And he would have a pulley system where he just pull out a, a chain or a cable wrap it around the cow's head and drag them into the truck. And oh yeah. And one day I I distinctly remember this. I'll tell this story real quick so we can move on. He had came to our farm and there's a lots of other farms in the surrounding area and it looked like he had already made three or four stops because he already had three or four, you know, cow carcasses on his truck. He gra- he comes to our farm and picks up the one that we had called about, drags it up on there and granted this is about lunchtime and these animals have probably been laying for 2 to 3 days and I know you've you know what the distinct smell of roadkill is. Oh, yes. This guy's truck smelled like that 24-7, but he had four cow carcasses on his truck. And he's like, man, it's lunchtime. I'm hungry. So he gets up on the the rack up above his truck that sits over the cab of his truck, props his feet up on all these dead bodies, and starts to eat his lunch. Busts out the lunch box and just chow- chows his lunch down before he leaves the farm. <laughs> <laughs> True so story. Gross. So gross. And I hope that guy's last name wasn't Picton because this was the late nineties. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That's nasty. Um, so I also wanted to touch on a little bit of some of the evidence they found. So they found skulls cut in half stuffed with human hands and feet. They found the DNA of 33 different women. They found bloody clothing, a 22 revolver with a dildo attached to it. Now <laughs> Picton would later say in court that that was, a makeshift silencer that he used when he shot was it Marnie Frey? So yeah, it was. Uh, or I'm sorry, it was Mona Wilson. I'm sorry. So when he shot Mona Wilson, they also found 357 Magnum rounds, two pairs of fur-lined handcuffs, a syringe with blue liquid, and Spanish fly. Now the syringe with blue liquid's interesting. I don't think we talk about this anymore in the narrative here, but um, somebody would later testify that Picton shared with them the easiest way to kill a heroin addict was to inject them with washer fluid, and so they suspected that this syringe with this blue liquid was a syringe filled with washer fluid for your car, and then. Did I mention the Spanish fly? <laughs> All I can think of is that Beavis and Butthead episode where they're trying to get the Spanish fly so they can get chicks. And this guy seems about as smart as Beavis and Butthead. So it kind of goes hand in hand, I suppose. Yeah, I, I almost wonder if the that random character that they ran into on the streets with the killer tattooed on his forehead wasn't a uh, cartoon cameo of Willie Picton. <laughs> Might have been. Pork chop Rob. Yeah, because the guy just laughs uh, and just, just doesn't really say anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's true um and then this case would turn out to be like one of the most expensive if not the most expensive investigation in canadian history uh, i think it was estimated around 70 million dollars by the end of 2003 so um that's uh that's a big deal yeah that is huge especially i still don't understand why they tried to keep it under wraps so much you know, they're spending $70 million for this case, this investigation. It seems like they could have expedited a lot of that if they would have just opened up the case and, and got some of this information out there. They don't have to get all of the gory details out there, but they can give an indication of what's going on and either hope, help slow down the process of his killing or, you know, have more people on the lookout for, you know, what are the signs? What's happening? Who should we be looking for? Seems like they could have tracked him down a lot quicker had they released more information. Yeah, most likely. And, you know, look, they they paid the price for keeping it all under wraps. I mean, that's a ridiculous number. 
to be paying for this kind of stuff for one guy, you know, um, and for all the, the times they didn't act on some of the stuff and the criticisms they'll get for that, um, you know, there, there you go. $70 million later. Absolutely insane. The case against Willie was long and complicated. So a prejudged trial ruled that Willie would be tried separately for six cases of murder and the remaining 20 cases, while one was thrown out due to the feeling that there was a lack of evidence. To ensure a fair trial, much of the details were suppressed while the trial was ongoing. Picton pled not guilty to the murder of the six women. Marnie Frey, Georgina Papin, Brenda Wolf, Andrea Josperi, Serena Abbotsway, and Mona Wilson. During trial, there was a lot of evidence presented, such as DNA items from various missing women, blood spatter, and witness testimony. One of the witnesses was Andrew Bellwood. He lived in, at the Picton farm for several weeks in 1999. Bellwood testified how Willie would act out how he strangled prostitutes. The defense attacked Bellwood's credibility, stating he was a heavy drug user and was not credible. However, his testimony was chilling and very detailed. The other key witness to testify was Ellingson. She was the only person who would testify to seeing Willie and a human corpse in the same location at the same time. The defense was able to pick apart that story using inconsistencies in her story and past drug abuse, including the fact that she was high on drugs that very night as reasons why the jury should not believe her testimony. The defense continued by painting Willie as a dimwit with little ability to commit these murders on his own. Jury deliberation lasted for two weeks, and on December 9, 2007, the verdict was read in court. Picton was found not guilty on all six counts of first-degree murder. And again, I repeat, not guilty. Jurors were in tears as the verdicts were being read. However, Picton was found guilty of second-degree murder on all six counts. He received the maximum sentence of 25 years in prison without the chance of, for parole. The jury had a tough time making their decision because they couldn't decide if he acted alone or not. This is the reason that he wasn't convicted on first-degree murder. Regardless of the fact Willie was not found guilty on first-degree murder, he was levied essentially the same punishment anyway. On January 7, 2008, the Attorney General filed an appeal against Picton's acquittals on the first-degree murder charges. The grounds of the appeal was for a number of evidentiary rulings made by the trial judge, in addition to certain aspects of the jury instructions given by the judge and the way the trial was split into 6 versus 20 charges. The victim's families were shocked. They were not briefed about this appeal and didn't understand why it was being levied in the first place. The appeal was said to be largely strategic in that they anticipated another appeal by the defense. The prosecution's rationale was that if picked an appeal to convictions and if the appeal is allowed, resulting in a new trial, the prosecution could hold a new trial on all 26 charges of first-degree murder. On January 9, 2009, two days after the prosecution filed an appeal, Picton's lawyers filed a notice of appeal in the British Columbia Court of Appeal seeking a new trial on six counts of second-degree murder. The lawyer representing Picton was Jill McKinnon, who had been a Crown prosecutor in the 1970s. The main areas of the defense were contesting was the trial judge aired in the main charges to the jury, the responses to jurors' questions, amending the jury charge, similar fact of evidence, and Picton's statements to the police. The Court of Appeal dismissed the defense by two-to-one majority. Picton was still, however, allowed to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. His notice of appeal was filed in the Supreme Court of Canada on August 24, 2009. On July 30, 2010, the Supreme Court of Canada dismissed Picton's appeal, affirming his convictions by unanimous rejection. In addition to this, the court had formally stayed the charges of the additional 20 murders, meaning they would not go to trial. In 2016, a book claimed to have been written by Picton titled, In His Own Words, went up for sale and caused a lot of controversy. Petitions and actions by government were put into place to try to prevent Picton from profiting from his work. The process for which Picton was able to get his book published is as follows. He got his manuscript out of prison by passing it to a former cellmate, who then sent it to a retired construction worker from California named Michael Childress, who typed it up and credited it as the author on the 144-page book. Provincial Solicitor General Mike Morris and an online petition on Change.org each sought to remove the book from sale on Amazon.com. Premier Christy Clark expressed interest in introducing new legislation similar to laws in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, and Ontario to prevent criminal profits from such books. Colorado publisher Outskirts Press ceased publication of the book and asked Amazon to remove it from their site after finding out that, the, that although Childress had his name on the book cover, the author was actually an incarcerated criminal. So kind of breeze through some of that trial stuff, and you know I'm not a lawyer, and some of that stuff is gobbledygook in my opinion. Um, <laughs> it was pretty crazy that, uh, you know, he, the the appeals process was was pretty nuts in this case and the fact that um the prosecution you know went ahead and filed an an appeal on the conviction 
um, and didn't tell anybody and, and, and the, and the families didn't find out until it went public. Um, that was, that was kind of strange. Um, but you know, it all, all worked out in the end, I suppose. Well, I think the thing that is most alarming to me and, and some of the proceedings that you read through was even though he was found not not guilty of first degree murder in these six cases. He was found gr- guilty of second degree murder. And I think there was a note there that said it carried the same penalty. So what the fuck is going on in Canada? You mean to tell me I can go to Canada, buy a pig farm, grind up 50 women and only get 25 years in prison? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. And you know, I don't, again, I don't know how that all works. I don't know if it's 25 years per charge. So then it adds up to six times 25. Okay. You know? That would make sense. So I- I'm assuming that's how that works, but I don't know for sure because I'm not a legal expert. So one of our astute listeners, hopefully you are a legal expert. You can explain that to me because I'm an idiot. (laughs) I just, yeah, I don't, I don't know how that all works uh, to be honest. Um, I believe I would assume that it's like a six by 25 and then, you know, so it ends up being some ridiculous, (laughs) like 130 year sentence or something. Um, you know, that's what I imagine because it always implies that he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Well, I mean, he is, I think when he got the 25 year sentence, if that's exact, I mean, if that's what was handed down, I think he was 60 at the point. So they're assuming he's not going to live past 85 in prison. Yeah. He's 69 right now. Yeah. I don't know how that all works because I'm not sure if it is. um, I don't know. I'm looking it up right now if you hear me typing. So a person convicted of second degree murder gets an automatic life sentence, but the judge sets the date of the parole eligibility with in the range of 10 to 25 years, a first degree murder conviction gets an automatic life sentence with no parole for 25 years. So it looks like, so he was 58 when he was convicted. They got 25 years before he'd be eligible for parole. And it says, um... Someone's quoted in here saying it will be difficult to ever conclude that Mr. Picton will ever see the light of day again. I don't know. It says nothing about these being consecutive terms or anything like that. So it might just be a straight 25. Yeah. Well, hopefully somebody can weigh in and set us straight. But that just sounds crazy to me. Yeah. I would love love for somebody to let me know what you think about that. But I, the way I'm interpreting it right now is that my theory is completely wrong and that it is straight up 25 years and that you, he's eligible for parole at 25 years. I, I think, though... I guess if you're eligible for parole at 25 years, that means the judge can say you're not getting parole and you're stuck in prison. So I think it's life in prison with the eligibility for parole at 25 years. So that means that the judge can say you're not getting out. I don't know. I'm not good at the legal stuff. I'm I'm sorry, guys. This is uh, not my area of expertise. I just like to talk about murder. (laughs) Well, hopefully with what we described and talked about in the details of the case, that um, there's no way in hell that guy ever gets out again. (laughs) Yeah, there's a. I'm I'm just kind of browsing a couple articles here, and it says it was only a year ago that serial killer Robert Pinkton's second degree mur- murder convictions were upheld by Supreme Court of Canada, ensuring he serves a minimum 25 years with no chance for parole. Several websites and news stories list 2032 as a date for full parole eligibility, 25 years after he was convicted, and then it says he could actually be out without an escort in just over 12 years. His eligibility date is February 22nd, 2024, and he's eligible for full parole in 2027, 25 years after his original arrest date on February 22nd, 2002. And then this, uh, someone was quoted as saying, oh my God, I was thinking in 2032, I thought he'd die in prison. He would be 74. And yeah, so wow. I guess we'll wait and see. Yeah, no kidding. Um, the good news is I did see that uh, British or Van- wherever he was at, British Columbia, Vancouver, whatever that area was in Canada, they did destroy the farm. The farm no longer exists. They demolished it. I'm assuming that uh, the state took possession of it after the case. I'm hoping, you know, they spent $70 million to prosecute and research this guy's case. <laughs> the least they can do is seize his farm. No kidding. No kidding. Yep. So, um, yeah, this dude's like a pretty nasty human obviously and pretty much that's the theme on this show is we only talk about disgusting human beings i don't know why but it's entertaining well that'll do it this week for case number 10 pork chop rob as we affectionately call it if you enjoyed our show please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts uh currently our biggest listenership comes from stitcher spotify and itunes so 
please check us out there. Leave us a five-star review. It helps us get exposure. It helps us feel good about our personalities and ourselves. Um, If you'd like to support us financially, head out to our website, www.killerpod.net, and click on the support button at the top of the page, or you can hit us up on our brand spanking new Patreon page. It is patreon.com forward slash killer podcast. And if you wouldn't be so kind as to follow us on social media and make us feel really well about waking up at 4.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, you can follow us at Twitter and leave comments at killer underscore podcast on Instagram at killer podcast. Facebook is facebook.com forward slash killer podcast. And you can also shoot us an email directly at killer podcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you lovely people. I love it when you guys comment and uh, hit us up on our uh, on our pages. So thank you so much for those of you who do reach out. Uh, I try to respond to every, everything you send us, and I know Craig does as well. So we really appreciate the feedback. Um, it's been really enjoyable talking to you lovely people. So hit us up. Um, you know, we talk true crime. You can ask us anything you want, um, true crime or not. So we look forward to hearing from you. Stay safe.